hello again. Uh, again, my name is Iriol Shire. I work for Red Hat, and besides Perf, I also work on uh, eBPF and related things. So basically, this presentation is about how BPF trace works internally. If there's still the guy with the question how printf works in BPF trace, I have that answer on slide 30 or something like that. So this, is, this will be the one part of the presentation showing actually how you transform the program, how, how the program that you put uh, to the BPF trace, how it's transformed uh, to the bytecode, to the eBPF bytecode. And one or two su suggestions uh, that can make your program uh, faster to omit some, uh, some useless uh, stuff. If you survive that, there's a second part of the presentation and it's about the recent and planned uh, BPF trace uh, features. So I will go through some of the stuff that we are working on and which is about to be, about to be merged. Uh, first of all, uh, the big picture. So this is the circle how BPF trace works. So uh, the user provides uh, those programs that uh, Jerome was uh, explaining how you put them together. BPF trace works uh, through the, uh, is using LLVM uh, libraries to take that program, compile them uh, to the eBPF bytecode. So for every, uh, every probe that you specify in a program, there's a, there's a uh, piece of the byte, eBPF bytecode. Uh, BPF trace using the libbcc and libbpf to take that program, load it to the kernel, and attach uh, that code uh, to the probes. Once this is done, all is, all is uh, set up, and the kernel starts to go through the probes. It triggers the eBPF bytecode, the eBPF bytecode runs and it produces uh, some data. The data are stored in memory areas that we call maps or uh, are stored in the perf ring buffer. BPF trace is actually watching all those things, the maps and the perf ring buffer, reading the data and printing the data back to your terminal. So this is how all is uh, glued uh, together. The scope of the presentation, as I said, is how the program itself that you put to the BPF trace, how it transforms uh, to the eBPF bytecode. So how you get from the human readable to almost human readable. And later on, uh, the kernel actually can uh, uh, JIT the code. That means it translated to native instructions. However, this is not scope of the presentation. I will just show you uh, how these transformations are, are being made. Uh, to actually understand how the uh, BPF trace works internally, it's good to know uh, what's the environment the eBPF bytecode is running in. So it's not, uh, it's not difficult. You have 10 registers. Uh, which few of them have uh, special functions. Register one to five works as a functional argument. So whenever you call a function, the BPF uh, code needs to set up those register. When you get to the function uh, from the function, if the function returns any value in R zero, uh, you will get uh, the value from the from the function. Uh, there are two special uh, special values that every eBPF code is executed with and they are stored in register 10, which is pointer uh, to the stack. Stack is a piece of memory that you can use and initialize and then pass pointer to the stack from the stack to the PPF helpers. Another special value is R1. It is context of the probe. Usually it's the place where you would go for the, for the arguments for the probe. So when the probe is executed, you are tracing some function. The function has some arguments the context uh, value uh, will let you uh, get the values for the arguments. The helper calls, uh, eBPF subsystem provides many helper calls that you can use in eBPF bytecodes. It provides like the PID, the timestamp, all those things that, that you need. 
in the in the assembly, it's the uh, whenever you see call, it's the call to the helper. And how to get the actually how to work with maps? You need the descriptor for the map, and in the bytecode is this symbol map square brackets and ID. ID of the map is the map descriptor. So anytime you see that, it's actually the value of the of the map descriptor. Uh, the output of the bytecode is something that uh, what's produced by BPF tool. So if you write like the BPF tool proc, dump, xlet it, ID, and ID of the program, this is the output. Uh, this is the disassembly you will get. And it's quite easy. All the arithmetic operations are quite easily uh, under, understandable. So let's start directly with this easy one. So uh, you are telling uh, BPF trace to put probe uh, on the syscall uh, right trace point, and you are telling the BPF, uh, BPF trace uh, to put number one to the map value. So not so much useful program, but it serves as nice uh, example how you access the map. Uh, the map is accessed by the helpers. There are several helpers how to access map. And anytime in a BP, um, BPF trace, when you write the add sign, it means you are accessing the map. The map which is used in BPF trace is almost always uh, the hash tab and hash tab, uh, which is per CPU. So those two are the most uh, used things. So when this program is actually executed, uh, it all goes to update the value of the map. It's a hash tab. Hash tab means that uh, you have key and values uh, glued together. Uh, but if you have program like this, uh, which no, with no key, we will get to the keys later on, you actually access the zero key of the map. So the pseudocode is uh, easy. Put key, uh, put zero to the key, put, val, uh, put the, uh, one to the val, and call the, call the helper. So you need to prepare the register to the R1. Ah, right, uh, every helper has like C, um, C style declaration, which you can get from various uh, header files. This is where I get mine. Uh, so you see the C style declaration of the helper. So first argument is the map. So this is how you get the map ID, put it to register one. Then you prepare the value zero, uh, put it on the stack, and take the stack pointer and have it as a second argument. The same way you prepare value number one, put it on the stack, you have the third argument, and the last argument is flex, which is uh, zero for this. And this is how the program will be translated and work. Initialize the data, call the helper, map is updated, number one is there. Let's do somehow more. Uh, useful map update. Uh, just a disclaimer, this is not what you should be doing. It's just for the sake of the example. I will get just in few slides how, why this example is wrong. But it nicely demonstrates uh, when you write updates for maps like this, uh, what will actually happen in the code. So in this example, you say in this syscall, write trace point. Uh, update the map value with the one. Every time you go through the probe, the map value will be increased uh, by number one. And the pseudocode is quite easy. Uh, first, you need to get the value from the map. That means uh, the program itself has no idea. It doesn't have any, any data space. It always needs to look for the value. So this is how it's done. Uh, first, you look up the value with the key you need. The key is zero because we don't use any key. You check if the value exists, you increase by one. If it doesn't exist, uh, you create uh, value number one and you, uh, you update the value. Uh, the way it transformed to the eBPF code is like this. First, you call uh, the lookup. Uh, then you check up on the values and increase uh, whatever you get from the map, and finally you you update you update the map. So this this scheme that first you need to look up the value and update the value will repeat every time 
when you in BBF trace will use access uh, or increase uh, the value or do whatever to the value uh, of the map. So it will generate in those two core helpers and all the things uh, in between. Now, well, why you shouldn't be doing this is that for this purpose, when we want to count, actually, we have a special helper, which is called count. And it's doing exactly the same thing, but it's doing it on the per CPU map. So the first example uh, is having the value of the hash, but it's just a single hash. It's a global hash. And when it's accessed, uh, accessed from multiple CPUs, uh, here you have like race window where the CPUs uh, will fight about the data and will uh, end up in the, in the wrong result. <laughs> if you use the count function, it will do exactly the same, but in the proper way. Uh, it will actually use per CPU uh, um, hash tab, which you can see right here, which means that there is a hash tab for every CPU. So every CPU goes and have access to its own hash tab, its own value. And so when the program finished for every CPU, you have the value. And the BPF trace will actually summarize all those val values and print you just one final value, one final correct uh, value. Just for the fun, if you compare those things, uh, so this is like benchmark I'm using when testing things. It actually creates many processes and they are uh, reading and writing in between themselves. So there's a lot of uh, bright syscall executed. So the base, uh, base time, the benchmark uh, executed was 78 seconds. If you use the per CPU uh, way of counting uh, the syscall, uh, it's still horrific, but it's not that bad as uh, the 262, uh, 66 seconds for for the regular update. So not only that it's wrong, it's also uh, really slow. We can do better. We can do better for some of the cases. Uh, there's, a, there's a feature called global data uh, in eBPF that actually uh, allows you to uh, skip uh, the lookup and update to the map and just provides pointer to the data, uh, to the program. The thing is, uh, it's only usable for simple values without the keys. So it's usable for this, uh, this example, where you have one value and you increase that. Then you can use uh, those five instructions that will actually do the same as the previous one, but much, much faster. So uh, the code will just get the pointer uh, to the value, uh, and you will use the locked increase and those four instructions basically is all you need. But again, it's only, it's only uh, if you have simple case like this. Once you start using keys, this, this will not work. Uh, there's already a pull request uh, for this uh, to get to BPF trace. The pull request recognize cases like this and uses, uh, use uh, uh, this kind of code. Uh, and it actually results in a great speed up. So, the last one is just like four seconds. It's four seconds more for the same benchmark. So uh, again, it is just for the map uh, without the keys. What do we do with map with the keys? So the answer in this is that we are doing basically the same thing. When you have the simple map without any key, the key is zero. Now you are starting using the key uh, like this. You can put the add sign, square brackets, and say like CPU. And now you are gathering count for every CPU uh, that's uh, executing, executing uh, the probe. And what happens in the bytecode is that the bytecode uh, from this point is still the same. You look up the value, you increase the value, you update the value back. What's in addition, of course, you first need to know what's the CPU. So you call the uh, CPU helper uh, and put it as a key to look up and put it as a key uh, to the update. The rest of the bytecode is basically the same as you would use uh, without the key. You can actually change the key. You can put more things uh, to, the, uh, to the map. I'm actually not sure what's the, what's the limit for the key, but 
I guess you can get crazy and put many more values there. And the things you need to be aware is the logical thing. When you use something as the key, first you need to retrieve that key. So uh, CPU, PID, and command, all those things needs to be first gathered, put to the stack as the key, and then there's the lookup and update of the map. Then the, the code is basically the same, but just using, using uh, the new key. How do we access probe arguments? So, uh, we have various probes, well, trace probes <coughs> and k-probes, and BPF trace allows you uh, to see the values of those functions, of those trace points. So every trace point has uh, some argument, and those arguments are passed to the eBPF program uh, in that special context value. At the beginning is the R1 register, and it holds uh, the pointer uh, to the trace point data, but it holds the pointer, uh, and the memory is somewhere else, that means you need to read the data first before you actually can use uh, the value. And we have another helper for that, BPF Pro Breed. Uh, so what happens when you use actually, this is how you, uh, this is how you use the argument uh, in the probe. You put the arcs like it's a, a structure pointer. You use the C thing, uh, the dereferencer and uh, access uh, the argument. The argument is like if you go to the TraceFS and check on the uh, format for var various uh, syscalls, uh, or basically all the events, every event has this format file, you will see the arguments that you can use. And that's basically what uh, BPF Trace is looking to, to find out the value where in the data. This is actually how the trace point data looks like. This is like the structure of the trace point data. And BPF Trace is using this pointer adding this 35, which is the offset of the count, saying that it wants to read eight bytes, and reading the bytes, uh, returning it in, I don't know, R0? Yeah, probably. No. Uh -huh. In the destination, yeah. So anytime using this arcs count, this, this thing is generated, this probe read, and that's actually uh, the problem. BPF trace is not smart enough to know that it already, already that it was already reading the values. So anytime you use this arcs count, this helper call will be generated. The way how to work around it, if you know that you are using something from the arcs, uh, and you know they are using it uh, in other places in your program, just put it to the temporary uh, variable, and from that time on. Uh, only that variable is accessed and not uh, that code is generated uh, only once. Uh, for the k-probes, it looks uh, differently. Uh, the k-probes uh, again pass the special pointer uh, to the data, uh, and the, uh, but the data itself contains all the, leg all the registers uh, which uh, the k-probe was executed with, and uh, the arguments are basically passed in the register values, like the first arguments for every function. Uh, well, on x86 uh, might be different on other architectures, but uh, most of the time the values to the arguments for the functions are put uh, to the registers. So what the program, this simple program does when it's arc2, is basically uh, the k-probe way of, of accessing the third argument to the probe. It goes to the registers, finds the proper register, the register that actually carries the third argument, and it reads that. So no special, no special helper is needed, needed here. You just read the value uh, from, the, uh, from the data that is passed to the eBPA program. So, from, for k-probes, you don't need any, any workaround. You don't need to be aware of uh, by using those arc, arc values. Finally, printf. So BPF trays have uh, like many, uh, many functions defined for BPF trays, not just, you can call like helpers that are defined by the uh, eBPF subsystem, uh, which transform to the 
calling to the kernel. But we have uh, also many uh, like inside functions. One of them is printf, and the way it works actually is the way they, that works most of the functions in in BPF trace. So when you want to print the string, uh, every printf is actually recognized by uh, by the format string that you want to print. So this is like uh, global ID of that printf, and that's basically what BPF trace is using in the program. So for this simple example, it stores the ID because there's just one, so the ID is zero. Uh, stores the ID to the ring buffer. So every time you are actually using printf or another function, uh, BPF trace uh, creates ring buffer, perf ring buffer. And it's like the way of communicating the data between the kernel and the BPF trace. So what the program does, it stores the value number one, which is the ID of that string, stores it uh, to the uh, ring buffer. And BPF trace is actually uh, monitoring the changes in the ring buffer. It sees the value. Uh, it will get the ID. It knows what format string is for that ID. It will get the data. If there are some data, I have another example with the data. And it will put it together and print it. Uh, print up the data uh, to the console. So this is actually, you can see, that's the, that's the delay and that's something you should be aware of when uh, using the functions. There's always a paraphrasing buffer in the middle. And if your program is printing like, like really a lot, the ring buffer can get, uh, get uh, populated like uh, that there's no space. Because every time the, uh, you read from the ring buffer, you make space for another data. But when the kernel comes with the data to the ring buffer and there's no space, it just drops the data. So uh, if you're printing just too much and BPF trace is busy with other things maybe or is slow enough to read the uh, ring buffer, you can start uh, losing the data and not see what you are actually uh, supposed to see. How it works uh, with the data actually, so I have this uh, trace point, syscall write, uh, that's, the, that's the string, and those are the values. I'm printing the arcs fd and arcs count. And again, we store the id, which is zero. Of course, there's only one, only one string. Now we need to read the arcs fd, which I uh, got in previous slide to that. So you will read the value of the arcs fd, store it uh, to, the, uh, to the stack. You read the value of the arcs count, store it to the stack and you call the perf event output uh, helper, which puts all the data, the ID and the data uh, to the ring buffer. And again, BPF trace will check if there's any data on the ring buffer, it will see the data, it will see, oh, you want to do the printf. It will put the data together and uh, print the data to the console. As I said, this is similar workflow for other, other, syst uh, other functions. So like print, system, cat, exit, and probably uh, uh, other functions, they are using the same workload. Uh, just the put ID on the, on the ring buffer, put the data, BPF trace in the user space, uh, do the rest. Predicates. Predicates are a really nice way to like, syntactically say uh, if the probe should be executed or not. So you can, in this example, uh, you are gathering uh, the data from uh, power trace point, CPU frequency, and populating the map for CPU. And then you profile uh, with 100 megahertz uh, and putting the data uh, from the frequency to the histogram. And there's a pred uh, predicate that says don't execute uh, the probe unless there's some value uh, in that uh, in that map. Uh, this works actually how you would imagine it works. So frac CPU is basically the access to the map with the, uh, with the key, which is CPU. So you need to call, you need to get the CPU ID, uh, use it as a key uh, to this frac map, get the value, check if the value exists, if the value is different than the zero. If it's zero, we just exist, exit, and if it's not zero, the program continues. Uh, 
so not really interesting. What's interesting is that, once again, uh, if you use the same value of the frag CPU later in the program, uh, the same lookup will be generated. The BPF trace, uh, the previous example uh, for the arguments, and again here, and probably many other, uh, when you access something uh, difficult, not just mem access, uh, this, is, this is the scheme. It will be the code uh, for this value will be, again, the lookup for the uh, value will be regenerated again. So for this example, it's actually faster to skip the predicate, read the value uh, to the temporary variable, and then use later on the temporary uh, value variable. So you will just do the lookup, then you will check uh, the value, and the program continues without any other, any other lookup. It will, just, it will just use the value. Uh, of course, there are different predicates, but only if uh, the expression in the predicates repeats itself in the program, it's useful to do this. You will get rid of uh, one, one lookup. Histograms. So having this example that's actually using the histograms, uh, as Jerome explained, uh, the, the histograms are a nice way how to bucketize, uh, bucketize uh, the output. So like for this example, I'm saying that uh, I'm reading the frequency values and I'm putting them uh, to the bucket. Uh, we have two functions uh, for histograms. It's hist function and linear histogram function, which is this one, lhist. And what they do, they basically take the value that you provide, transform it uh, to the bucket value, and keep the count for the bucket. And later on, the BPF trace will display the value. So like here, uh, actually the arguments of the LHIS function is like zero is minimum, 5,000 is maximum, 200 is the step, like the size of the bucket. So later on in the output, you will see uh, like the frequencies from 800 to 1,000, there were so many, uh, so many values, and like you will get the values uh, for for every occurrence. How that works internally? Uh, so you have the add sign here with the megahertz uh, uh, megahertz uh, map. So again, it's a map update. So you need to look up the value and you need to update the value. Uh, the hist, lhist function basically only works to provide uh, the key for the value. So as you can see in the pseudocode, it's actually something you would expect. If it's less than minimum, it's zero, uh, or minimum, never mind. Uh, if it's uh, more than maximum, it's the maximum bucket. Uh, and all in between, we will actually put to, uh, to the buckets that it uh, goes to, uh, once you have this bucket number, you use it as a key to access the megahertz value, uh, and you keep, so this is the key, and the value of that bucket is basically uh, the increase count. So this is what this pseudocode is, uh, is doing. So you look up uh, the value for the bucket, check, it's different than zero, you increase. Uh, if not, number one, and you update. How it looks in the code, uh, so I skipped the map lookup, we already been through that. Uh, the LHIST function is basically just to compute, uh, compute the key, so it's all just arithmetic functions uh, that address the pseudocode I had on the previous slide. So it do the, do the math and end up with the number B, which is used uh, for the lookup to get the value uh, you check, is it zero, it's not, you increase, and you update uh, the value back to the map. So this is, this is how, uh, when you use histogram, this is how, how they work. Uh, the hist function, not the lhist function, but the hist function is actually using the buckets uh, which, has, which, which, are, which goes power to size, so they, uh, the function doesn't have this minimum, maximum, and the step. It's already being defined uh, by, the, by the function, but it's, it's actually, it's actually the same mechanism. When you, whenever you use the hist, it will end up with just a few of the arithmetic functions, so not a big deal. Uh, 
you can, of course, combine the histograms with the key. Uh, like you can use the megahertz and say, I want to also divide uh, those values in the histogram uh, with the key. And again, it's the map access and same, the hist uh, function only provides the key. And what this function, uh, what this example does, it just uh, chain the key together. So the bucket and the com will be used uh, as the key to access the value uh, to the map and increase the value, store the value. Okay, there were histograms, begin and end functions. Uh, there's no rocket science behind those, of course. Uh, it will start before you do anything, it will, uh, it will execute the program and it will execute the program at the end. It's interesting how it's actually made. Uh, it's made as a U-probe. Uh, so the BPF program uh, put uh, some calls like the begin trigger and end trigger uh, to its code and attach the U-probe to itself. So when it goes through the code, uh, the begin and end will be executed. So uh, quite easy, no, no big science. Apart from that, you can actually see that in the profile. The way it's being done now, and that you should be counting on, whenever you're using the begin and end, you will define the U-probe in the system, and BPF Trace is not doing it in the smart way. It actually doesn't uh, remove the U-probe right away. And anytime you have defined the U-probe uh, in the system, uh, there's extra code in the kernel that needs to care. Uh, whenever there's a U-probe defined, some mapping accesses, some uh, DMA functions uh, in the system actually got executed extra because you have uprobe in the system. So whenever you're using BPF trace with the begin and end, this is something you can see in your profile. It's not a big deal, but probably depends on what is your, what is your benchmark. So this is something just to be, just to be aware of. Okay, that's, that's the first part of the presentation about the internals. Uh, we'll do the questions later. Okay. Um, now it's the part uh, about how actually, uh, about the plant and uh, recent features. Uh, the main feature that got recently uh, to the BPF trace is the BTF support, uh, what it means. Uh, so the BTF means many things, but for BPF trace, it means that the BPF trace have access to the kernel type information. And it's nice because it can use this information to actually write program like this, uh, where you can access the current task, which is the pointer to the um, current uh, task object in the kernel. And you can access that, uh, that pointer uh, without actually using any include values. You don't need to, you don't need to use the kernel uh, devil package uh, or there are several ways how to get the proper headers and you always need to take care that you have those headers that uh, your kernel is running on. You don't need that anymore. Uh, there's a file exported by kernel in the sysfs file uh, which contains all the type information about the running kernel. So BPF trace is reading that file. And whenever you use, uh, whenever you like the reference some kernel object, uh, like this current task or some argument which points to kernel object, uh, you will, it will use this information and it knows where's the parent field, where's the pit field. So it doesn't need any, any headers. As of this moment, it's actually supported in Fedora uh, 32, and it works like uh, from scratch. I actually have demo for that. So, okay. So if I get to the Rawhide system and install the BPF trains, wow. Install BPF trains. Okay. Then, okay. Uh, then, yeah, what I prepared. 
actually uh, running on the background some uh, file access. And what you can uh, what you can do, you can use this. Okay, you don't see that. Uh, you can see you can use this program, which uh, put the k-probe on this kernel function, uh, which is uh, which is used during uh, when the file is open, and you can uh, you can get the values. Uh, so it's printing uh, the command. If you if you go uh, and hunt the parent, you can actually see that it's that's bash. And if you put like many parents, this way you can actually get to the init ID server. Yeah. Okay, still not. Ah, systemd. And we should be lucky now. Okay, so you will actually get to the, to the idle process. So this is a really nice way to, you don't need to care about the header files anymore. You can access the, uh, the thing uh, right away. Uh, next thing we are working on is like support new probes for the BPF trace and support probes, uh, row trace points and the tramp lines, which are like brand new. Tramp line, uh, rate, row trace points are not brand new. They are there for um, some time now, but only um, recently, let's say, they got the power of uh, using the BTF arguments. <coughs> and that's actually... It helps you, uh, what it allows you is that uh, when the trace point is called with the pointer to some kernel object, you can use that pointer uh, as an argument to the helper. And the helper can treat this object as a kernel object. It actually, it goes through the BPF verifier with the BTF information and it knows that this pointer actually points uh, to, the, to the kernel object and it can use it directly so it can use any uh, any function that kernel would use to, uh, uh, to do the to do the job. So uh, road trace points are already in uh, BCC. Also, the benefit is normal trace point. Uh, you need to perf to actually run that. So there's a perf layer for the road trace point. There's just pure uh, BPF uh, registration, so it's actually also faster. Uh, so it will be in. It's in BCC soon in BPF trace. Trample lines are. A uh, really nice way uh, to probe the functions. It's like k-probe on the beginning and end of the function. Uh, so it's for many functions uh, in the kernel. And again, same as for the row trace points, it can uh, it will give you the BTF uh, arguments. So here I have example. If you have a trample line on the VFS read uh, file, which actually takes the file object as a uh, as an argument, you can use this argument in the file path uh, uh, helper, and the file path helper actually doesn't need to check on that argument. It knows that it's a file pointer, it's a, a pointer to the uh, to the kernel object, and it can use uh, kernel functions to actually get you the path to the file. So this is not uh, in the BCC yet, not even BPF trace. This is something we work on. Uh, not only the BTF arguments for the tramp lines, they are also really fast. Just to compare, uh, so this is klogstat tool, which uh, gives you like the overview about the latencies uh, in, your, in your locking. It's getting the information from, it puts the probes on the mutex functions and counts like the timing in between of them and display that. If I run my benchmark, uh, so this is the base of the benchmark without, uh, without this on the background. Uh, the normal k-probe uh, will make that benchmark 10 times slower. If I use the same thing uh, with, the, uh, with the trample lines, it's just two times more, uh, slower. So it's really, it's really nice. Uh, new functions. So uh, I have like three functions that are either almost there or we are working on. First, FD path 
is the function that gives you the full path uh, from the past descriptor. So anytime uh, in your probe, when you have the file descriptor value, uh, you use it in this, uh, in this function and it will, it will result in the file, in the full path of that, of that file. This is quite useful for, for many people actually. <coughs> Uh, what's the state of it? Uh, we have the support in BPF trace, but the change uh, for the helper, for the actual kernel helper, still wasn't merged. Uh, it's just waiting for some review, and we need to hold off uh, the pull request uh, before it's actually accepted in the kernel. Uh, another function which is similar to previous one, and I already mentioned, is to get the same thing, the full path uh, for the file uh, from the uh, file, uh, file pointer. Uh, so with the BTF uh, powered arguments, you can actually pass uh, the argument from the function directly to the helper, and the helper will use like uh, BFS uh, kernel function to get the root. So it's quite efficient, and it will get you the full path. Uh, another plant function is SKB output. So there's already a helper which can, uh, when you put uh, when you put the uh, socket buffer uh, pointer, it will uh, it will actually uh, store it uh, to the to the ring buffer. And the plant feature in, in BPF trace is actually have a helper that you pass the pointer to the socket buffer. You put the name of the file, and all those buffers will be stored in the file, like in the TCP dump file. So, like network guys, maybe. Uh, can use it to, to see what's being generated in every, every trace point. And with that, that's it. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Is the uh, thread ID part of the data that you can get in a trace function? You mean like if you can get thread ID? Yeah, thread ID, yeah. I think so. Yeah, actually that's just one helper which okay. will get you together the process ID and thread ID. And uh, What about thread local data? Would I be able to get access to the thread local data? Uh, so we have this per CPU thread maps that you can use as a, ah, thread is per CPU, okay. I'm not sure about that. Uh, there's something with the local storage in the helpers, but I haven't had a chance to look at it. The Probably there is. If there's a use case, yeah. and if there are the things underneath, we definitely can, can do something about it. I'm not sure if any of the Jaeger or any of the other tracing uh, folks have done this, but let's say, for example, you figure out a way to instrument your server to add a span ID to the thread local storage mm -hmm. that you can trace everything that happens. Let's say, for example, the operation is per thread. So that way I can have a, have a map inside the kernel to trace every single write call that happens on behalf of that particular span ID. Uh, okay. Yeah, I guess so you can actually because do it's that. Easy to, it's, it's, easy to, it's easy to put it in the thread local storage. Sure, uh, but you can actually have the map and use the key like the thread ID for the, for the map and you can store whatever you want in the, sure. in the map value. So but, yeah, you could, but there's you could another level of indirection there because I have to go from the thread ID to another map and another map to whatever data I yeah. So, okay. It's doable. Okay, thank you. Another question? Hi. You mentioned you use uh, uprobe for the begin and end uh, commands. You use what? Sorry? Uprobes. Uh, user land probes. Uprobes? Uprobes? You probes, sure, yes. yeah. And uh, I was wondering if you run BPF trace the same binary several times for the, uh, different uh, tracing in parallel, uh, would those you probe confuse each other because they are attached to the BPF uh, trace binary? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I understand, but do you mean like if there's another you probe defined, if this will screw up your measurements or? Sorry, I didn't get it. Uh, I was wondering if the, you attach a uprobe to a specific function okay. on itself, 
But if you if there are several instances running in parallel of BPF trace, you will have several U probes that will trigger each other. So the U probe is local to the file, right? It's bound to the file. So when you insert the U probe uh, to the file, uh, when you actually execute that particular file and it hits the U probe during the execution, you will get that particular U probe. So it's tied like to the inode of the file. So this is how it's tied to the file. So if you copy that file, it will be different files. So uh, that was my point. If you uh, have several process, but from the same inode, from the same BPF trace binary, then they will uh, intersect each other. OK. Yeah, please come to me after the presentation. Sure. We, can, we can sort it out. It's possible there's a bug in BPF trace. <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite new and still being developed. So. All right, is there any other question? I guess not, so thank you, Yiji.